بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى. We thank Him for everything He has granted us. We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and all his companions. May Allah bless them all and may Allah bless every single one of us and our offspring, those to come up to the end of time. Amen. My brothers and sisters, a beautiful venue, lovely place here at this uh, University of the Philippines. And I really appreciate the fact that you have been sitting here from quite a while. And the fact that inshallah, uh, you have waited all day. Alhamdulillah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this evening a success. And to let us go home as people who have changed and transformed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all know that this, uh, the theme of today's uh, entire activity has been uh, stories of young believers. And the idea, inshallah, is to motivate us to be able to learn more, to be able to uh, promote that which we've learned, to be able to put into practice what we've learned, to be able to be inspired by the lives of the real heroes that we are supposed to be looking up to. And at the same time, to be able to deliver that message to the generations that are to follow in a way that the day we meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will be pleased with us. May Allah be pleased with all of us. Ameen. So my brothers and sisters, I start off with the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. In a nutshell, with some lessons that we learn from Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet Abraham, may peace be upon him. And thereafter, inshallah, I will go through the story of one of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, by the name of Salman al-Farisi. Salman from Persia. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us draw lessons from the stories because there is no point in knowing a story without actually going through what lessons we have to derive from that same story. So if I read so many stories and I know them off by heart, but I did not learn a lesson from those stories, I have wasted my time. Many of us know bedtime stories that were read to us perhaps when we were children. But if we did not learn a lesson from that, we just wasted our time. It made us fall off to sleep. That's what it did. So if, if you know the stories of the prophets and the stories of some of the companions, may peace be upon them, of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and you have not drawn a lesson, then today is the day that inshallah we will, you will change that perspective and you will change that attitude and by the will of Allah you will start looking at those stories and implementing them in your own life or in your own lives. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet Abraham was blessed by Allah in a million and one ways. That means in countless ways. If you take a look at his birth, he was not born into a Muslim family. He was not born in a Muslim family. He was actually born into a family that worshipped stones. Subhanallah. His father, some of the narrations make mention of a name, Azar. His father was one of those who was carving the stones, making idols. He used to sell these idols. His father used to sell the idols and make them for people. And the small idols for those who cannot afford big ones and the big ones for those who can afford it. And so when you want to pray, you need to pray to these stones. That's what the system was at the time. And those who have a big problem would have to borrow the gods of those who had bigger gods in order to solve their problems. But the young boy, as he grew up, he started asking questions. And this is lesson number one. Every one of us, no matter who you are, you need to ask questions. You need to know why you are who you are, what you, why you are doing what you are doing. Why do you have to do this? Why do you have to do that? All of these questions have answers. It's just that sometimes the people we ask do not have the answers. So keep on asking until you get the satisfactory answer. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, 
فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون بالبينات والزبر Ask those Ask those who have knowledge Ask those who have knowledge of the scriptures if you do not know If you would like to understand the clear signs and the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Then ask those who have knowledge And this is why don't be shy when you need to ask a question Don't be shy If you are shy you won't learn If you are too shy to admit that you don't know something Then you will never know it May Allah make it easy for us all. Ibrahim alayhi salam asked his father a question. Ya abati lima ta'budu ma la yasma'u wa la yubsiru wa la yughni anka shay'a. Oh my father, why are you worshipping that which does not hear you? That does not see, it does not hear, it does not see. Why do you worship that? And it doesn't help you in any way. These are idols. And the father answered him. The father gave him an answer of admonition. Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Ya abati inni qad ja'ani min al-ilmi ma lam ya'tik. Fattabi'ni ahdika siratan sawiyya. Oh my father, Knowledge has come to me that did not come to you. I know more than you actually. Something has come to me that didn't come to you. So follow me and I will guide you to the right path. But the father was too arrogant. The father was too arrogant. He was too proud. Do you know why he was too proud? And before I make mention of it, let us ask ourselves, do we have that pride in us that we cannot accept advice? Do we have that arrogance in us that we cannot accept what is the truth? If we do, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said, "لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مفقال حبة من خردل من كبر." That person will never enter paradise in whose heart is even a mustard seed's weight worth of pride. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked by his companions. They said, "O Messenger, peace be upon him." We like to have nice clothes and conveyance and so on. We like to take pride in our clothing and whatever else and our, you know, the material items of this world. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, that is not what we are talking about. That is not the definition of pride in Islam. If you have good clothes, it doesn't mean you are proud. If you have a nice motor vehicle, it does not mean you are proud or arrogant. If you have a lovely home, it does not mean you are proud or arrogant. So what is the meaning of pride and arrogance in Islam? بَطْرُ الْحَقِّ وَغَمْطُ nas. Those who reject the truth, they are arrogant, no matter how poor they are. And those who despise other people, you look at others as low, lower than you, you have pride and arrogance in you. And the Prophet says there is no space for you in paradise, not at all. Even if there is a small bit of arrogance in your heart, pride in your heart, no, there is no space in Jannah. It's impossible for you to go to paradise. That was a statement. لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال حبة من خردل من كبر. We should be scared when we hear this hadith. The Prophet says, remove pride from your heart. There is no space in paradise for the one in whose heart there is even a mustard seed's weight worth of pride. May Allah protect us. And what is pride? Two things. To reject the truth when it comes to you makes you a proud person, arrogant person. And to despise other people, no matter who they are, to make them feel like they are nothing, you are something, you are a big shot, they are zero. That is pride, that is arrogance. Today we will learn a lot from the lives of the two that we are going to be speaking about. One of them a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and the other one of the companions of the prophet, peace be upon him, by the name of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. So his father, Ibrahim alayhi salam's father, what did he do? He was too proud, he was arrogant, he didn't want to listen. He says, أَرَاغِبٌ أَنْتَ عَنْ آلِهَتِي يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ لَإِنْ لَمْ تَنْتَهِ لَأَرْجُمَنَّكَ وَهْجُرْنِي مَلِيًّا He's threatening his son saying, Are you trying to lead a life away from our forefathers? The style of our forefathers. My brothers and sisters, if your forefathers were wrong, 
they were wrong. If they were right, we will follow them. If they were wrong, we do not follow them, no matter who they were, no matter where they came from, no matter what. Ibrahim alayhi salam's father is telling him, hey, you need to follow me even if I'm wrong. How many of us with our children, they want to turn to Islam, they want to do good, they want to become better people. We stop them, we block them, we say don't do this. If that's the case, we join the ranks of the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The young boy wants to do something right and his own father is telling him, you dare do that. Stick to what your forefathers were doing even if it was wrong. No, that's not right. We should learn a lesson and I'm drawing, I'm intertwining the lessons into what I'm saying. That look, my brothers and sisters, let's learn from it. Let us encourage our children and those of our family members and others to do good even if we are weak. And when someone corrects you, even if he is younger than you, even if it is your child, take the correction. We are too arrogant and proud to accept that our young children correct us when we are old. We will say, look, I'm 40 years old. I'm the president of this organization. Who are you to come and tell me what to do? But uncle, you are wrong. You know, I remember a story when I was young. I saw a guy and, you know, he got up in the morning from his sleep and we were together. And what happened is behind his head at the back here, behind his neck, he had some of the wool from his blanket. Now, you cannot see what's going on here, you know. So, he had the wool in his behind here. And I looked at him and I said, brother, you know, there is some wool. He said, shut up, keep quiet. Who are you to tell me? I said, oh, okay, 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 fine. No problem. And he walked around the rest of the day with wool behind him looking like a fool. But this is the attitude we have. We are going towards Jahannam sometimes. Allah sends us a gift to say, walk towards Jannah. Hey, shut up, keep quiet. Who are you? I will fix you up. I will do this. I will do that. Okay, 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 relax. You, you carry on your way. I carry on my way. You have your way. I have mine. Subhanallah. But that's not how we should be. Ask yourselves, Wallahi, these lessons are powerful. They apply to us, not only in this country, but across the globe. We are sometimes too proud, too arrogant to accept what is right, to accept advice, to accept younger people tell us, to accept someone who might not be as powerful tell us, to accept the one who is working for us, correct us. My, I am the employer, you are just an employee. Who are you to correct me? Well, in the eyes of Allah, both of us are equal. If I see something wrong, I'm supposed to correct it. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, You see something wrong, you can do something about it by changing it yourself. If you have authority in that particular situation, you are in authority to do that, you may change it by hand. And if you don't have the authority or the ability to change it by hand, then at least talk about it. Ask the person, please, can you change this? This is wrong. This is unacceptable. And if you cannot do that as well, at least in your heart, you should feel that this is wrong. And that's the weakest point of Iman, which means beyond that, there is no space for a mu'min. So let's learn to take advice. My brothers and sisters, learn to take advice. People correct you. Alhamdulillah. You are reading salah. Balik Islam comes to you to correct your salah, take it by all means. They know more than you. The reason is, they learnt it now, fresh, pure. And where did you learn it? Some of us didn't learn it. We just saw our fathers doing it, so we did it. We don't even know what to say. Subhanallah. I hope you understood my example. For those who might not know what Balik Islam means, here in the Philippines, it's, it's a derogatory statement that refers to a revert Muslim. Some use it out of respect, but a lot of people use it in order to try and say Balik Islam. Balik Islam. Astaghfirullah. Ibrahim alayhi salam was Balik Islam. Do you know that? His father was not a Muslim. Not at all. Do you know that? Have you ever thought of it? The companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, all of them, 100% of them, were Balik Islam. Subhanallah. Wow, mashallah. Now you see the status of Balik Islam? Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Some of us were born Muslim, but wallahi, we are not yet Muslim. We haven't practiced. We don't know. And we look, Balik Islam, ya akhi, fear Allah. Who are you? Hey, do you read your salah? They read five salah a day. Maybe you only read three. Maybe you don't read. Subhanallah, look at it. So let us 
Remove this arrogance and pride from our hearts. Looking down upon someone just because he reverted to Islam. Is that the attitude that some people have across the globe? I was shocked when I heard about it. Wallahi, I was not impressed at all. People told me that you know what, if you reverted to Islam, sometimes in some parts of the country, they will call you, no, no, this person cannot lead the salah. No, for what? Who said they are purer than you because their book only started now the other day. Your book started a long time ago. It's full of dirty pages. May Allah forgive us, really. I'm speaking without gloves, you know. MashaAllah. We don't want to cushion the blow. We want to give it as it is felt because it's a serious matter. It's not something small. Uh, we spoke about the pride of the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam. What did it do? It resulted in him being cursed by Allah in the Quran. Subhanallah. Azar, he was cursed by Allah in the Quran. When Ibrahim alayhi salam felt for his father and he says, Oh Allah, I want this father of mine to get goodness. Allah says, Hey, you do not pray for someone whom we have cursed. وَمَا كَانَ اسْتِغْفَارُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِأَبِيهِ إِلَّا عَمْ مَوْعِدَهِ وَعَدَهَا إِيَّاهِ فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ أَنَّهُ عَدُوٌ لِلَّهِ تَبَرَّأَ مِنْهِ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَأَوَّاهٌ حَلِيمٌ Allah speaks of how Ibrahim promised that he would make dua for forgiveness of his father at a certain point and Delayed for a certain time, but when he realized that this is an enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he disassociated himself from him. Because Allah says, no ways. Pride and arrogance we do not accept. Remember you are one, just like everyone else. The day you die, your position stays behind. Your status stays behind. Everything, your clothes stay behind. Your perfume stay behind. Your wealth, guess what? Your children are killing each other because you left a lot. That's why. Those who didn't leave much, the children are much happier. They love each other. Those who left millions and billions, see what has happened to their families. Go and see. A lot of them, they are killing each other, fighting, no speaking. Because you stole so much. My brother, forget about this. This is dunya. This is something that you are also going to leave behind. Leave it. Subhanallah. So you leave behind everything. What do you take with you? You take with you your deeds. What deeds do you do? The deeds that are the deeds of your organs and the deeds of the heart. In your heart, you need to rid it of malice and jealousy and hatred and ill feeling. You need to get rid of all those qualities. This is when you will be able to earn Jannah, paradise. The deeds that you need to do, your salah, your zakah, your dress code, your shahada, your fulfillment of the obligations that Allah has placed on your shoulders. That is what will get you to Jannah. But when you have an ill feeling, you are automatically giving your good deeds away to others. There was one companion, the Prophet peace be upon him asked or told his people, if you would like to see a man from paradise, look at that man. And he was walking away. So one of the companions went behind him and followed him, tiptoeing quietly to see what he does at night. He, after Salatul Isha, that man went to sleep. He went to bed. He got up for Salatul Fajr, which means he did not read extra Salah at night. So later on they asked him, you know, the Prophet peace be upon him said, if you want to see a man from paradise, look at this man. What is it that you do? Surely there must be some hidden secret. There must be something you do that we don't do. He said, no, I am just normal. I just fulfill my obligation. Obligation here meaning the farad. I just fulfill my obligation as best as I can. And they cross questioned him and examined him. And then they found out that before he sleeps and reclines every night, he removes from his heart the ill feeling and hatred for his brothers and sisters indeed. Removed. So he has no ill feeling, no hatred. A lot of us, we fall in the trap of shaitan. We hate our own brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts and families. And, and the families of our wives, in English they are called in-laws. You heard that word? Ooh. Sounds tough, doesn't it? In-laws. The last time I said in-laws, someone said, A'udhu Billah. I said, no, no, please, don't say that. May Allah grant us love. May Allah grant us love, really. May Allah open our doors. Learn to love one another. If your duty of loving one another extends to all those in the deen, what about your own in-laws? They are closer. 
What about your own family? And you have to have a big heart, a very big heart to be able to do that. The bigger your heart, the easier your entry into Jannah. Remember this, you have to have a very big heart. You have to say, I'm sorry, when you are not even sorry. Subhanallah, when it's not your fault. I don't mean be a hypocrite, but I mean, I'm sorry. If I'm sorry is solving my problem, I'm sorry, my brother. I'm sorry, okay, fine. Sorry, khalas, let's, let's carry on. You need to say good words, let's learn. So this issue of pride is a primary issue that we learn from the father's reaction with Ibrahim alayhi salam. Yet, Ibrahim alayhi salam was destined to become one of the greatest of all prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the greatest. So what happened? The young boy, his father began to warn him. His father began to tell him that we will do this to you and that to you, threaten him. And one day when they had their festival where they had all the idols and they went to go and worship and so on. And they had the storeroom of all the unsold idols with Ibrahim alayhi salam's father. You know, in the, at their home they had a storeroom. The storeroom had all the idols. So Ibrahim alayhi salam says, I'm sick. I'm sick. He did not lie. He was saying, yes, I'm sick. He was sick of what they were doing. You know, I can either tell you I'm sick. That means I'm physically sick. Or I can tell you I'm sick and tired of what you are doing. Right? So he says, I'm sick, which means I'm sick of what you're doing. And he didn't go with them. He stayed behind. And then he went into this. This is a beautiful story for young children as well. But the lesson is for all of us. He went into this storeroom of his own father and he started talking to the idols. They didn't reply. I'm going to beat you up. They're just looking. I'll beat you up. I'll break you. They're just looking, no response. Hey, once, you know, one strike, no reply. Another strike, no reply. So he destroyed all of them. Then besides one, the big one. So when they came to him later on, obviously they found, hey, these idols are broken. He left the axe that he used on the big one. So when they came back, the old man, these are intelligent PhD holders of that time. You know, intelligent people, top people, leaders of society. You would think that these people are so well educated that they have some brains, but wallahi, their brains were snatched away by the devil. May Allah protect us. This is why if someone has a PhD, he still has to prove that he is an intellectual. It doesn't necessarily mean that he has common sense. He only has common dollars. That means he can use that PhD to get a few dollars. But since we don't know yet, we have to hear him open his mouth in common matters. May Allah forgive us. So what did Ibrahim alayhi salam do? He tells him, they came to question him. They said, who did this to our own gods? So someone said, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim is the young man who was here. He must have done it. So they went to him. Oh Ibrahim, are you the one who did this to our gods? You know what he says? He says, uh, you see the big one here? Ask him, ask him. He, maybe he knows something. If he can talk, he will tell you. Imagine a young boy addressing the older people and from this we learn wisdom and tact. As young as he was, he stumped them mid-wicket. He gave them something they could not answer. They cannot reply. He says, look the big one. It has the axe on it. Ask it. If it speaks, it will answer you. So they said, you know that it does not speak. He said, well then how can you worship what does not speak, what does not hear, what cannot help itself? How do you expect it to help you? But that common logic meant nothing to those people. They wanted their money, their status, that what people would say. That is what kept them away from the truth. Today with us as well, when you have a lot of money, when you have a very high position, you are more worried about what people will say than when you are a person sleeping under the tree. When you are sleeping under the tree, you hardly have clothes and something to eat. 
It is easier for you to come to the right path than a person who is well entrenched in society and the hierarchy of society where they are so high, it's very difficult for them to accept the truth because they feel, what is everyone going to say? I might lose my wealth. I might lose my status. People might, but you don't know. It is Allah who owns status. When Abu Sufyan at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was with the Romans, they asked him, who are the followers of Muhammad? That time he was not a Muslim, Abu Sufyan. And Muhammad ﷺ was in Mecca. So Abu Sufyan says, a lot of them were from amongst the poor, the poor of Mecca. And there are some noblemen as well. And those who were noble from high homes, they lost whatever they had. Take a look at Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Musab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu. Powerful example. He was a child of a very wealthy, wealthy family in Mecca. They say Musab ibn Umair was such that you could smell him before you saw him. That's how he used to use his perfume. He accepted Islam. Everything was taken away from him. He struggled throughout his life. He was martyred in the battle. And at the same time, that was the battle of Uhud. And at the same time, when they wanted to bury him, they could not find something enough to cover his body. Mus'ab ibn Humayn. Imagine, he was such a wealthy person. His clothing used to drag on the floor when he used to walk as a young lad. Everyone knew, handsome man. Wow, young man, so good, so handsome, so wealthy. But he chose what was right. Today we speak about him. The others, we don't even know their names. You realize this? We don't even know their names. So Allah has kept goodness for those who sacrificed for His sake. The others, we have no clue what their names were. I give you an example of Jesus, may peace be upon Him. We know Him, we know the names of some of His disciples and we know the names of some of the important people. Do you know anyone else there? All the evil people and the lot, those who rejected, do you know them by name? No. Maybe one or two who were really evil in order to set an example, Allah might have mentioned them, but we don't know them because they were irrelevant. No matter how wealthy they were, today they are gone. Allah says, وَكَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا قَبْلَهُمْ مِنْ قَرْنِ هَلْ تُحِسُّ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ أَحَدَ أَوْ تَسْمَعُ لَهُمْ رِكْزَا How many nations, huge nations have we destroyed before them in the past? Do you feel any one of them? Do you feel the presence of the Pharaoh here? Do you feel the presence of any one of them? Do you even hear the slightest sound from any one of them? The answer is no, but they were more powerful than you. They owned more than you. They had much more than you. And at the same time today, they are not even to be known. Allahu Akbar. The lesson is for us. Don't be deceived by 70 years in this world. It's nothing. Your greatest grandfather, Say four generations back, your great great grandfather, you don't even know his name. He was a big man, powerful. Really, a lot of us don't know their names. He was so powerful, the same applies. We are one tenth their power, but we think we are something big. I'm someone. That's why I can't accept the truth. Ibrahim alayhi salam story. Look at how his father was rejected. So the young man gives the answer. They still rejected. Then they said, throw him in the fire. So Allah says, as they tied him and threw him into the fire. The owner of the fire, your maker, my maker, the maker of the fire, the maker of this water, subhanallah, the maker of absolutely everything, the one who made it, the one who gave it to us. He says, Ya barda wa salaman ala Ibrahim. O oh fire, become cold and be a means of peace for Ibrahim. So the fire burns off the, the chains and the ropes according to one of the narrations. But it does not harm or touch Ibrahim. The whole community is watching. The fire burning. The man thrown into the fire. And they see him calm, relaxed. You know, laying back in the fire. And walking calmly out of this furnace. As though nothing has happened to him. And still they don't believe. They do not believe. Why don't they believe? Everyone is worried about the big man. Who's the big man? Azar, the father. Big man, we can't accept. So who accepted? Do you know who accepted? His wife and his nephew. Who was his nephew? Lut, the prophet Lut. May peace be upon him. And the wife, Sarah. Later on to be. Subhanallah. They accepted. Wow. This is the message. 
The rest of them, they didn't accept. Not at all. And this shows us that sometimes a lot of people will be doing things that are wrong. Even if the whole world does what is wrong, it does not make it right. Remember that. And even if you are the only one who is doing what is right, it does not mean you are wrong. If you know it's right from revelation, keep on doing it. It's a lesson. We are inspired by the dedication of Ibrahim He refused to worship the sticks and stones. He went to a place known as Harran. In Harran, he saw these people worshipping the fire or worshipping the stars. And then he says, these stars, are they my God? No, they cannot be. He never ever worshipped the stars. He never, according to the correct narrations, he did not consider worshipping the stars or the moon or the sun. But he made statements in order to explain and convince the people of Harran that this is not worth worshipping. So if you read the verses of the Quran, Allah says, فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلُ رَآ كَوْكَبًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي فَلَمَّا أَفَلَ قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ When the nightfall had come in and the stars came out, he looked up and said, perhaps this is my God. He did not say it because he was thinking it was his God. But he wanted to prove to the people of Harran that the stars are not your God. So he waited up to the time the stars disappeared. And then he said, how can I worship something that disappears? Are you hearing the point? Then he continues with the moon. When he saw the moon, he tells the people of Harran, perhaps this might be worth worshipping. This might be my Rabb. Rabb meaning the one who made me, the one who's in control of all my affairs. He didn't say it's my ilah. He didn't say I worship it. He didn't say it is Allah. There is a difference between the two. One is Rabbun, the one who's in control of all your affairs. The one who... Uh, the one who you admit is the maker, nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, and so on. But when you say Allah, He is the one whom acts of worship are rendered for. There are some people who admit that Allah created them, but they don't worship Allah. The kuffar of Quraysh. If you ask them who created the skies and the moon or who created the skies and the earth, they will tell you Allah. But do they worship Allah? The answer is no. They don't. So they know who created the creation. They don't render worship to Him. Or they associate partners with Him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that Ibrahim alayhi salam, after he saw the sun come out, he told the people of Harran, and the statement was a statement of mujadala. It was a statement of a debate or a form of an argument that was presented to these people. Oh, perhaps the sun may be the one who made me. It might be my Rabb because this sun is so powerful. It is the biggest. And then when the sun sets, he says, لَإِن لَمْ يَهْدِنِي رَبِّي لَأَكُونَنَّ مِنَ that was the statement he made when the moon had disappeared. He says, if my Rabb does not guide me, I'm going to be from amongst those who are misguided. And when the sun sets, he says, Allahu Akbar. He asks Allah to guide him. And then he says, وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِيَ لِلَّذِي فَطَرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ حَنِيفًا وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ I turn my face in worship to the one who created the skies and the earth in purity, in purity alone, without association of partnership to him. I am not from amongst those polytheists. I will worship whoever made me. This is known as Abrahamic or Abrahamic monotheism. Ibrahim alayhi salam, a young boy, he realized that it is common sense to say that my maker is the greatest. Whoever made me is the greatest. It's common logic to say that I will only worship he who made me. So what will you call him? I will call him 
the worshipped one because he alone I worship so how do you translate the worshipped one in Hebrew you say Elohim or you say Eloha in Arabic you say Allah did you hear that so what is it referring to the worshipped one Allah when I say Allahu Akbar I am saying the worshipped one is the greatest any mistake with that statement never can never be but the father kicked him out of the community. He went out. I told you he was going to Haran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. May he make us from those who learn lessons. Some of us, we do not follow the truth because we are scared. What is my father going to say? What is my mother going to say? Look at what happened to Ibrahim. The minimum is we can draw some inspiration that if we suffer as a result, even a little bit, Allah knows. Those whom Allah loved more than you and I have suffered much more. So who are we? It does not mean Allah does not love you when you are struggling, when you are suffering, when people call you names, when people make your life difficult. It does not mean Allah does not love you. No, He loves you. And in fact, it means He loves you more. In Allah إِذَا أَحَبَّ عَبْدًا When Allah loves a worshipper, He tests him or her more. Look at the greatest of creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What difficulties did he not go through? Subhanallah. So Ibrahim alayhi salam grows up, fine young man, mashallah. And he worships Allah alone. And then Allah says, okay, we're going to test him. It's not enough to say that I'm on the right path. And then you think that Allah is not going to test you. Allah will test you. He has to test you. Listen to what he says in Surah Al-Ankabut, right at the beginning. Alif Lam Mim Ahasib Al-Nas Ayyutraku Ayyakulu Amanna Wahum La Yuftanun Allah says Alif Lam Mim do the people think that it is enough for them to say we are believers and that we do not test them in that belief? Allah has tested those before you in order to distinguish who is truthful in their claim and who is false. When I say I'm a mu'min, I say I'm a Muslim, Allah will test you. Are you really a Muslim? Okay, let's see. So we put certain things in your life. Do you follow the rules and regulations of Allah or that of shaitan? If you follow that of Allah, you are a true Muslim. You have proven your metal and Allah will grant you a reward in return. If you follow the path of the devil, return to Allah before it is too late. Return to Allah before it is too late. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He tested Ibrahim alayhi salam in a way that was so difficult because Ibrahim alayhi salam did not have children up to the time he was quite old. And he used to make dua for offspring with us. I'm not too sure about the system in this country but I'm familiar with it in a lot of countries. You don't have children? May Allah bless you with children. Amen. But if you don't have children, it becomes difficult because every little while people tell you, when are you starting a family? Hey, it's not like we're doing this purposely, you know. You hear my point? But we, come on, it's about time you have kids. It's been 10 years. You cannot remain on a honeymoon for so long. Hey, relax. You'd rather say, may Allah bless you with children and walk away. Stop hurting the sister. It's in the hands of Allah. Maybe Allah did not bless them with children. So... Be careful, my brothers and sisters, how you speak to those who don't have children. It hurts them tremendously when you utter words that are cutting. Oh, how many years are you married for? Oh, I'm married for 10 years. You mean you still don't have kids? Wallahi, the, the, the sister, once you leave her, she will start crying in the background. Because it's not in her hands, it's in the hands of Allah. But my sister, don't lose hope. In the mercy of Allah, keep on making dua. Allah knows. Allah only does that which is best for you. If you are a mu'min, it's for you, your dunya and your jannah. That's what it is. 
Sometimes you might not have so many good deeds to earn Jannah, but the sabr that you bore because you didn't have children is enough for you to enter paradise in the companionship of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Perhaps. May Allah open your doors. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he calls out to Allah for a long, long time and then he gets a child after a long time. Ismail alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him through a dream that you need to sacrifice this child of yours. Now, why did Allah say that? Allah did not say it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted something evil to happen. No, na'udhu billah, Allah forbid. That's not correct. Allah merely wanted to test the faith of this man. Now that he recognized me and he knows that the instruction is coming from this particular source that you worship, let's see if you follow it even though you do not understand it. Can I ask you one question? The children you have, do they belong to you? Anyone? The children you have, do they belong to you? Some are saying yes, some are saying no. They do not belong to you. They were never yours. They are never yours. They belong to Allah. Only Allah. He decides and chooses what He wants to do. They are only entrusted to you for a very short period of time. That's it. That's the true answer. These children are not yours. Can I tell you what else is not yours? The body you are in right now is not yours. It is actually not yours. You might think this guy is foolish. It's me, man. Look, I put up my hand. Wallahi, it's not yours. It is an amana entrusted to you. A trust that is entrusted to you for a short period of time that you are allowed to use as a uniform that you came with into the world that you will have to put back in the stack when you are leaving this world and you go back. The soul will go back without the body. Did you hear that? So the body belongs to who? To Allah. That is why you're not allowed to tattoo because it doesn't belong to you. Allah says, hey, imagine someone goes on a holiday and they say, brother, this is my car. Can you please look after my car? I'm going for two weeks. I will come back. When he comes back, there is a painting of a fairy on the car door. <laughs> come on. Whose car is this? It's my car. Why did you paint on it? Come on. It's my house. Why did you break down this room and put another room here? I told you just to look after it for a little while. When I come back, give it to me. Same applies to your body. Allah finds your body after some time with a big tattoo here of something. Who told you to do that? Who said this body was yours? Allah says, if I want, I could take it away and I can take it away some, a few organs at a time. We might have to amputate your leg and it's gone. Does anyone ever feel the amputated leg after it is separated? No ways. It's gone separated and it's out and buried and it's decomposed into the soil. You, can you say that was my leg? It's no longer yours. It's over. It was only entrusted to you for a short period of time. Get that straight. Get that straight. So your children are not yours. Allah allows you to use the word mind. Bearing in mind it's temporary. Just to make you happy. That's all. Just to make you happy. This is why when Allah did not give you it means he didn't place the burden upon you. To have children is not fun. It's a big responsibility. Huge. Nowadays people are frightened to have children because of the environment. It is so hostile that it's so difficult when you have children. It's not all about making them wear clothing and so on. And plonking them in front of the television so that they start doing what Tom and Jerry do. No. From a young age the child is doing what Tom and Jerry does. You know. They look at you like this. Where did you get it from? I'd rather have a child who's trying to read Salah. They look at you. They follow you. If you read your Salah five times a day, one year old child will mimic you, whether you like it or not. They will fight to wear your hijab. They will fight to wear your cap or whatever else, your type of clothing. I promise you, that's the plan of Allah. Allah says, we have created children in such a way that they will follow, they will learn, they will absorb. What do they absorb? Huh. Can I tell you what? Angry birds. <laughs> absorb. So the child comes out. <clears throat> but they are angry because you taught them angry birds from a young age. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. They are, it is a sponge that absorbs. Instead of absorbing Quran, instead of absorbing things that are good, sweet words, a good accent to speak with, to communicate with, we have made them absorb something because we were lazy. 
father was busy doing something, mother was busy doing something. Well, then why did you have children? What was the reason? So when you have children, you can get Jannah through the way you looked after them. Subhanallah. Ibrahim alayhi salam is told in the dream and he tells his son. Ya bunayya inni ara fil manami anni adbahuka fanzur madha tara. Oh my son, Ismail. And he loves him so much. He says, you know, I've been instructed through the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came through a dream to sacrifice you. So what do you think? What do you think I should do? The son was so blessed in his upbringing. He says, if this instruction comes from Allah, then do as you've been instructed. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. If this instruction comes from Allah, do what you have to. You will find me to be very patient. I will help you to fulfill the command of Allah. Did this command make sense? The answer is no ways. It did not make sense. It cannot make sense. The only sense it made is that it's an instruction of Allah. To a human mind, no sense. Ibrahim alayhi salam says, well, it came from Allah. I have to do it. With us, we have instructions from Allah that make a lot of sense. But we still don't fulfill them. When it comes to your prayer, when it comes to your dress code, when it comes to your attitude, when it comes to the fight against racism. Racism is not just a race as in color, but even tribes and societies and people who come from this part and that part. Across the river, we are already racist. Do you know that? If there is a river dividing two people, this side of the river and that side of the river have a racial problem. We can call it racial or tribal or nepotist, whatever you want to call it. There's a problem. We have to fight all that because that is the instruction of Allah to fight all that. We understand it, but we still don't fulfill it. Ibrahim alayhi salam did not understand it, but fulfilled it because he knew where it came from. Allah. And the son is saying, okay, I will help you. Imagine. I will assist you. قَالَ يَا أَبَتِ فَعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرُ سَتَجِدُنِي إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ Oh my father, do as you've been instructed. Insha'Allah, you will find me from those who are patient, who can endure. Subhanallah. So as he goes, the devil comes to try and distract him and he pelts the devil. Hence today, we go for Hajj and the pilgrimage and we pelt the devil. Not that the devil is there in Mina. Mina is not the residence of Shaytan. No, some people think that. When I went for Hajj and I've been for Hajj a few times because I lived there for a few years. And I tell you, I had people tell me, Oh, I'm so delighted today we have a war. You know, recently we had Mayweather. You know the story where they cheated with the result? Am I right? I have to say that because I'm in Philippines, right? <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So they say we're going to pump him up because he is the devil who comes to us every day. I remember in Mina where the shaitan is supposed to be pelted. People go with umbrellas and ask, you, I'm going to hit you today. You've come to, my, to me so many times and they take their slippers and they throw them and they take big rocks and they say, Ay, you. There is no devil there. The idea is the devil inside you. Take it out, Allahu Akbar. And throw a little pebble into the basin in order to remove the shaitan from inside. So your pride is gone. The shirk is gone. The bid'ah is gone. Everything evil is gone. Your arrogance is gone. Your racism is gone. Your laziness is gone. The next day you come back and you pelt a few more. So all your bad habits are gone. When they are gone, after those few days of pelting, you come back as pure as the day you were born. That's one of the ideas of hajj. What's the point of hitting, hitting, hitting the devil when the devil is inside here, man? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to remove the devil within. Really, remove the devil from inside of you. Take out these bad habits. Sit and think about it. You will do yourself the biggest favor when you fight yourself. Your own nafs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So Ibrahim alayhi salam pelts. And he continued. And when he got to the point where... He was about to fulfill that instruction of Allah. 
Allah replaced the child with a ram from Jannah. And Allah loved the deed so much because of the lesson that is learned from it that you will fulfill the instruction of Allah come what may. So Allah says to the mu'mineen, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ إِسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا Allah has made it compulsory upon those who can afford it. The mu'mineen, the believers, to go for the pilgrimage at least once in your lifetime. So that you learn the lessons. You know, people go for hajj. They think it's a tourist little thing, you know. Oh, where are you going? Oh, I'm going for hajj. You go there and you want to enjoy. If the accommodation is not five star, we start complaining. If we don't have proper facilities, we complain. My brother, my sister, the idea is for you to come back a pure person. I have one experience in hajj. Can I tell you what it is? Something that you need to know. Whatever you are spoiled with, Regarding in this world now regarding materialism whatever you are spoiled with in this life when you go for Hajj something's going to be wrong with that item let me explain if you live in a luxury palace and you are a wealthy person when you go and book your Hajj you, they will give you a room that is somehow small not purposely but that's just the plan of Allah to test you is life all about that luxury palace of yours come and see what it's like if you are the person who eats the most Delicious of food every day. When you go there, you're going to have some problem regarding food. I promise you. In a lot of cases. You are tested. If you are a person who is so worried about time for everything and you get angry. When you are there, people will tell you, just wait here. Wait here. You know, this is the sign. Exactly like this. Sabo, sabo, shui, shui, sabo. And eight hours later, they come and they tell you, sabo, shui, sabo, sabo, shui. You will learn it. And if you try to get angry, ooh, subhanallah, they'll kick you out. And the worst thing is when they tell you, Jal Bukra. You know what that means? Come tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. Typical. It's a test from Allah. For us and for them. Not just for us. Even for them. It's a test from Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. But these are some of the challenges. They are minor. We need to sit and think, what is all this about? You know, when people really make you angry and you can swallow that anger, you have achieved a lot. You have fulfilled the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you can put your pride, you know they say, when you can put your pride away, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. They say when you put your tail between your legs and you humble yourself, you know that I had to do this. Look down and subhanallah. Just adopt the instruction of Allah. Allah tells you this, alhamdulillah, that's it. That's your jannah, that's your paradise. Without following the instruction of, of the owner of paradise, how do you want to go to paradise? I always tell people that when you want to make a cake, you read the instructions. If you do not follow the instructions, how do you expect the cake? Right? You don't. We want a cake without following the instruction. You are buying Coca-Cola and you are putting it into a bucket and putting it in the oven and you want a cake to come out. How? People say, no, we don't do that. But that's exactly what you're doing. You want Jannah, 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 you're talking of paradise, but your deeds are heading towards hell. How can that happen? It cannot happen. So change, do something about it. Life is really a big deception. If you think of it, think hard. We're all going to go the, the prettiest, the healthiest, the wealthiest, the most beautiful, the, the most powerful. They will all go, all of them, everything. So don't just waste your life here for a few years. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, that was just one incident in his life. Like that, there were so many incidents. And I think I've spoken quite a bit about the life of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam. But I've shown you how to draw lessons. Every little aspect. Look at, look at him with his father and look at him with his son. Big difference. Very big difference. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be at least following the footsteps of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And you know what happened? After that, whenever he made a dua, the dua was answered. Whatever he said, he made a prayer and his prayer was answered. This morning I was in the city of Cotabato. And you know what happened? Someone asked me a question of a dua. What dua is to be made for something? 
And to, now I am telling you, and I told them as well, when you are friends with Allah, ask Him and see what happens. He will give it to you straight away. All you need to do is become friends with Allah. How do you do that? You know. You know how to do that. Become friends with Allah. Don't become friends with your wealth, with your looks, with the wrong that is happening in society, with the environment. Because in that case, you will call out to Allah, call out to Him, call out to Him. And the hadith says, a man calling out to Allah, really desperately calling out to Allah, but his clothing is haram, his food is haram, his drinking is haram, everything he's doing is haram. How does he expect to reply? How does he expect to be replied? Guess what? Through the mercy of Allah, still sometimes he gives it to us. That's how merciful Allah is. But a lot of the times we do not deserve what we've asked for. What did we do for Allah? Very little. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, after he was tested in so many different ways. Wallahi, so many. We've only mentioned one. He says, Oh Allah, this city of Mecca, protected. Is it protected today? Yes, it is. Oh Allah, grant its people produce that will come from all over the world. What happens? Go to Mecca, try and buy produce. You'll find it from everywhere and anywhere. At any time you find grapes and apples and bananas and the best of the world comes there. Oh Allah, bless this place so that the hearts of the people want to come here. It's done. How many of you want to go to Mecca, inshallah, for Umrah or Hajj? Put up your hand. The whole lot. See? Whose dua is this? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Why? Because he made friends with Allah. So Allah says, What? Allah took him as a Khalil. What is a Khalil? The highest level of friendship. Allah says, We took him as a Khalil. Muhammad وسلم, is also Khalilullah. But Ibrahim is Khalilullah mentioned here where Allah is saying, We took him as a Khalil, as a close friend. So that's the secret. Become a friend of Allah, then ask him and see what happens. He made dua for the city of Mecca. He made dua, whatever he made dua for. Do you know what he says? Oh Allah, let my children be from amongst those who have nubuwa, prophethood. They, they serve you. They worship you alone. I'm not just worried about me. Qala wa min dhurriyati. Allahu Akbar. Do you know what he says when he made, when he made the dua? Or when he built the Kaaba? And he was with Ismail alayhi salam. And he says, oh Allah, accept it from me. رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ Allahu Akbar How many of us pray for our generations to come? How many? Sometimes when I start a lecture, I like to say, May Allah bless us and our offspring to come up to the end of time, up to Qiyamah. Have you heard me say that? Where do we get it from? We get it from the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worry about your generations. Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Oh Allah, make me and my son submitters unto you. You know what that means? Muslim. Muslim means someone who submits to Allah. You submit. You know that Allah instructed khalas. Even if I don't like it, I accept it because Allah said it's okay. Subhanallah. With us, Allah can have said it's okay. If I say it's not okay, it's not okay. That's the attitude we have. If Allah told me to do this, I think the whole community is going to be upset if I read my salah like this because we're sitting in a plane or we're in the public area. I'm not. I remember once in Switzerland, we had to read salah in the airport, myself and my father. And you know what happened? We, were, we put our little prayer mat and we were reading and we were shocked to find so much interest that that generated. People are saying, hey, that was so beautiful. What happened here? What were you doing? And so on. Imagine if we just said, oh, I'm shy. I don't want. Wallahi, there are people right now, as we speak, who have been through an evil life. Non-Muslims who are considering entry into Islam. And some of them have already entered Islam. Because they know we're worshipping Allah alone, our Maker alone. You put your head on the ground, the most beautiful position you can ever, ever get into. And what are you saying? Oh, you who made me, you are the highest, you are the greatest. Oh, my Maker. Oh, you whom I'm going to return to, you are the greatest, you are the highest. That's what you say when you're down there. Subhanallah. So Ibrahim alayhi salam makes the dua. 
He says, Oh Allah, the two of us make us submit as unto you. And from my progeny, from our progeny to come, our offspring, the generations to come as well. Subhanallah. May Allah help us and our generations. So this is Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. The beauty that Allah bestowed upon him. All the prophets that came after him were from his family. All of them. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam included. Jesus may peace be upon him. Isa alayhi salam included. Moses may peace be upon him. Aaron may peace be upon him. The rest of them. All of them. The family of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. What a great blessing. Zakaria alayhi salam. Yahya alayhi salam. All this. Banu Israel. Everyone. It goes back to Abraham. The Jews, the Christians and the Muslims. Everyone goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us learn the lesson. I want to uh, end the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam before I proceed to the next story. I want to end the story by saying my brothers and sisters, one thing we learn for certain is that Ibrahim alayhi salam's life rotated around pleasing Allah, making friends with Allah. And so Allah gave him everything in return, everything he got. Subhanallah. After a certain point, Everything was given to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all a good lesson from that beautiful story. Now we move on to the second part of the session and I've joined the two together. I know it will be a little bit longer but I'm sure you have, you'll give me a little bit of time. I'm coming from further than you are inshallah. <laughs> Salman al-Farisi, a young boy, he came from a family that was very wealthy. He came from a family that was highly respected in Persia. The area known as Asfahan today, roughly. And he was a young boy. His father was one of the fire worshippers. He was one of the chiefs of the fire worshippers. In fact, his father was in charge of keeping the fire alight. So when, when the people come in to worship the fire, it needs to be burning so they can worship the fire. So when the fire is dwindling, the father used to be in charge of keeping the fire alight. And at a certain time, he handed that responsibility to Salman. Young boy, hey, you need to look after the fire, make sure it doesn't die. Imagine you are making sure that your God doesn't die. Imagine. Where, this is why I said the PhD brain. You know what I'm talking about? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us realize things. Common sense, logic. Spirituality, religiousness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us close to him. So they kept on keeping the fire alive. And he kept on keeping the fire alive. And his father loved him so much that he didn't allow him to mix at all with people. He didn't allow him to go out. He was fearful. My son, my son, mustn't go out. Mustn't mix. The environment is very bad. Just now I might lose him. So the father one day was very, very busy. And he could not fulfill certain errands that he had to. So he decided to rely on his son. He says, oh my son, I need you to go into the city and to do me the favor. The son says, what is the favor? So the father mentioned whatever it was. I want you to do this and this and then you come back. As soon as you're finished, come back. So Salman, the young boy, he goes out to the city alone for the first time. And his wide eyes, because obviously you're seeing things, you know, wide eyes. Have you ever seen children who don't have a television at home? When, you, when they see a screen, what do they do? <laughs> so one day I asked the youngster, Hey, you're looking at it like you've never seen one before. He says, yes, I haven't. <laughs> and he's looking at it. I haven't seen one before. Which means they're surprised because for them they haven't seen this before. So the young boy goes out and he's looking carefully. And he passes a church, a Christian church. And he listens to them praying. They were singing songs, praying in whatever way. And he looks and he says, hey, what are they doing? So they were praying to a God, God, the unseen. He looked and he says, hey, this sounds better than what we are doing, man. We are worshipping fire. I keep the fire alive, man. I keep the fire alive. People are coming to worship it. Aha, this is much better here. Much better here. So he, he goes in, he stands on the, by the door there. They notice the, the, the young boy and he starts asking a few questions. They answer his questions and he's very, very impressed. And anyway, he's convinced that ah, this is a better faith than the one we are following. What did we tell you in the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam? Ah, learn to ask questions. Without asking questions, you won't be able to arrive at the truth. And keep on asking. So he was late and he realized I need to get back home. So he rushed back home. 
and it was very late. He did not do what his father told him to do. So his father asks him, hey, where were you? He says, hey, you know what, dad? I went into the city and I was overtaken by these people who call themselves Christians. And you know what? They pray. They, they pray in a much better way than we do. And their faith is much better than ours. It's much better than worshipping this fire here. So his father says, what? No ways. Impossible. Why did you go? You're not allowed to go. And it's very bad. They have a very bad faith. They are evil people. They are very rotten people. They have bad habits, bad this, whatever. His father told him, you know the propaganda of the media? Exactly that. When you're interested in Islam, what happens? Hey, these are terrorists. They'll kill you. Watch out. Be careful. Hey, we're terrorists. Come on, relax. I always tell people, you know, I learned this from, I think it was Brother Wahid. Someone was asking a question. A non-Muslim was saying, you know what, um, why are Muslims terrorists? So the brother says, well, how many non-Muslims are here? So they put up their hands, including the person asking the question. Well, don't you feel so safe here? The answer is yes. Well, if we were, then every one of us would really be such that no one would want to mix. But you're so safe in our midst. It goes to prove that Islam is not preaching, promoting or teaching terrorism in any way. And those who perpetrate those type of crimes, they are not following Islam. They are doing it for some other reason, either political or either their own whims and fancies. But they cannot justify it from what Allah has revealed and what is taught in Islam. That's one thing you need to know. So the same applies... People will always want to keep you away from goodness by speaking bad about that goodness. Remember that lesson. So if someone says, uh, I'm interested in Islam. Hey, are you okay? You know, you're going to have to wear hijab. You know what? They'll enslave you. They'll do this. They'll do that. No, no, no. Learn the truth. So Salman al farisis father decides to tie him. Tie him. Look at how foolish a father can become. He locks his own son in his house, in a room, on a pillar with some leg irons. You know the leg irons they have? They put a chain on the legs. They want to tie like you're in Guantanamo Bay. May Allah forgive us. The father ties the son, fearing that the son might escape to these Christians. So when the father ties the son, the son is not so thick, you know, he's intelligent. So they used to come with him, they used to come to him with some food and they used to come to him with a few things. So he sent a message to the church to tell them what happened and to tell them, hey, I'm one of your followers. So at the beginning, he used to worship the fire. Then he became a Christian, Salman. And what did he do? He took Christianity very seriously. He told them the day when he met them, the first time, he asked them, where is the origin of this faith? They told him Jerusalem. They told him, you know, it's there in Sham, Sham. So he said, I want to go there. But anyway, now he was tied. So he sent a message to them saying, if there is any caravan that is going to Sham, let me know, I will make a plan and I will release myself from these clutches and then we will go. I want to go, I'm interested in going. So one day when there was a caravan going to Sham, they sent him a message. So he somehow made his own plan and he released himself from the uh, leg irons and the, whatever he was tied with and he ran away in the night, gone, disappeared into thin air. Where is he gone? He's gone. With the caravan to Asham. He arrives in Asham and he goes to meet the, the, the senior leader of the church, the archbishop. And he goes and says his story. This is who I am. I come from a very wealthy family. My father is a leader. And my father used to make the fire. We used to worship the fire. I came out one day. I saw people worshipping God. So I, I wanted to do that because it's better than worshipping the fire. So now they did this to me and that to me. And I've come to you and I'd like to spend my days with you. And the archbishop reluctantly agreed. Okay, it's fine. Okay, come. Since you are a person, you know, we need to give you shelter. We need so on. So he stayed with this archbishop and he noticed something very strange. That the archbishop used to collect money and keep that money for himself. He used to steal. He was corrupt. He was a corrupt man. So Salman al farisi he was shocked. He says, hey, I thought this faith is so good. But in his heart, he said, no, the faith is good. But this person who's doing this is wrong. One day that archbishop died. When the archbishop died, everyone wanted to raise him to sainthood. So Salman says, hey, this man is a thief, he's corrupt and he's a robber. They wanted to beat him up. 
How dare you speak about our archbishop like this? He said, no, I can prove it to you. Okay, prove it. Okay, let's go. I will show you where he has been hiding all the treasures. He took them to a room and surely they found treasures. All their charities and donations of gold and whatever else there was, they stashed away for that man. Did it help him? The answer is no. So what the people did, according to the narrations, they crucified that guy and they stoned him or whatever they did. But they, it was an undignified send-off. You know, they call it a send-off. So they sent him off in an undignified manner because they were upset. And a new archbishop was appointed and Salman al-Farisi was with this man. And he was such a good man. And Salman says, I haven't seen a, a person more dedicated than that up to that moment. And when that man became old, Salman says, I learned so much. When that man became old and he was on his deathbed, Salman al-Farisi asked him, he said, you know, I want the original teachings of the Bible pure. So tell me what to do after you are gone. So he led him, he told him, go to the, another city altogether. So he, Salman al-Farisi says, when he passed away, I went to that city, to a certain man. And I told him, so and so has asked me to come to you. Because I'm looking for the purest teachings of the Bible. The purest teachings of Jesus Christ. May peace be upon him. So he said yes. He allowed them to, him to stay there. And he, Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu says, I found this man to be similar to the other one. And when he got to his deathbed, the same thing happened. Where? He was instructed. He asked, where should I go? He was instructed to go to another place. And then he was instructed at one stage to go to Ammuriya. And in Ammuriya, that archbishop tells him when he was on his deathbed, the archbishop on his deathbed says, now there are no more honest people left. But we have arrived at a time when we have been promised that a prophet would be sent by God Almighty in a peninsula whereby there will be rocky land in between which will be green palm. So Salman says, how do I get there? What happens? Anyway, he kept on working in Ammuriya and he used to see the Arabs come there for business and for other reasons. And they were describing their cities and their places and they described this place where there were there was rocky land with greenery and so on. And in his heart he said, I think perhaps we might end up going there. So one day he wanted to go to the Arabian Peninsula with one of these caravans. And so he gathered all his wealth and he went to a certain caravan and told them, if I give you my flock, will you take me to the peninsula? Will you take me to this area? They said, yes, we will. They took the flock, they took all his money and everything that he wanted to pay and they put him into the caravan. And as they went, they got to a place called Wadi Al-Qura. Wadi Al-Qura is further away from Medina. Salman, the young man, he was now a young man, youth. At that point, they took him, they told him, you are a slave now. You have no one to protect you. We are selling you in the market. We need the money. What? These people are selling him? So they sold him and someone in Wadi Al-Qura purchased him. He was a Jewish man. Or he was a certain person, whoever he was. He purchased him in Wadi Al-Qura and Salman became a slave. A free man was enslaved. So he's working for this man. And one day after some time, a cousin of his, he was a Jewish man, a cousin of his comes from Medina Munawwara and he bought off Salman from his own cousin. He says, oh, you have a slave. He's a good guy. I need him. Okay, buy him. So much, he paid and he took him. So this Salman al-Farisi ends up in the outskirts of al-Madin al-Munawwara and he is a slave. And he kept on working for a long period of time and so on. After which one day, a relative of this guy in Medina, a relative of the owner of Salman, is speaking to, to the owner of Salman al-Farisi while they were in the garden and Salman al-Farisi was busy doing something either on a tree or he was busy doing something. And the one is complaining to the other saying, you know, in Makkah, there's this guy who had come and he 
he was claiming to be a prophet and now he's come to Medina, he's claiming to be a prophet and he says this and he says that and he says he has come with a completion of what Jesus peace be upon him came with and what Moses peace be upon him came with and so on. So Salman al-Farisi, he dropped what he was doing and he said, what did you say? So his owner looked at him, said, hey, get back to work and gave him one slap. What are you interested in? You're not supposed to be asking questions. You're a slave. But Salman says, Subhanallah, I can't believe that this prophet is here in Medina. Allah drove me all the way here in the way that he drove me in order to meet this prophet. So the man in Ammuriya, the archbishop had told Salman that when the prophet comes, there will be three signs. The first sign is that he will not eat from the charities. The second sign is that he will eat from a gift. And the third sign is he will have a mark on his back, similar to the size of a pea, that will be on his back at a certain point that is known as the seal of the prophets. You will see it. So Salman al-Farisi says, I found out that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in Quba. And I wanted to go and see him. So at night, I took some dates and I quietly ran out. And I saw these people gathered and they were all listening to this man. And I looked at him and I went forth and I said, you seem like you've come from outside. I have some dates of charity that I'd like to give you and your people. Perhaps you want to eat. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, took it and gave it to his companions. He thanked the man, the young boy, and he gave these dates to his companions, but he did not eat from it. So Salman says, Sign number one. <laughs> he didn't eat from it. So a little while later, the Prophet peace be upon him shifted from Quba to Medina. And Salman al-Farisi happened to get another opportunity to rush quietly. He took another bit of dates and he went and he says, you know what? Uh, these are just, this is just a gift that I would like to give you a few dates, good dates from the garden. And I'd like to give you some of these dates. So the Prophet ﷺ realized that this is a gift. Because he heard him say, this is not a charity, it's a gift. So he ate one or two pieces and he gave the rest to his companion. So Salman says, mm -hmm. sign number two. He ate from the gift. He didn't eat from the charity. And then a third opportunity arose for Salman al-Farisi when someone had passed away and the Muslims were burying him. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, was wearing a, a, a piece of cloth on the top. And he moved the piece of cloth and Salman al-Farisi is trying to look on his back to see the seal. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, notices that this young man is trying to see this on my back. So he dropped the garment slightly in order to clear, clarify it, to say, you know what, the garment has dropped a bit. Salman al-Farisi saw the sign and began to cry. And he went to the Prophet, peace be upon him. He declared his shahada. He narrated his story. And subhanallah, he also explained how he was enslaved. The whole story, I am the son of a wealthy man, a person. Where's his father? He gave up his father and his family and everything he had to for the truth. He went into Christianity. And from Christianity, he followed the Christian teachings. Those pure original Christian teachings led him to Muhammad This is why we as Muslims believe that the original manuscripts of the Bible contain in them the glad tidings of the coming of the comforter Muhammad May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. Ameen. So Salman al-Farisi radiallahu an. Now he was known as radiallahu an. The Prophet peace be upon him says, go to your master and ask him if you could buy your freedom. So he went to his master. His master says, yes, I want you to give me 300 trees, date palms that bear fruit. And on top of that, 40 uqiyya. Uqiyya is a measurement of gold or silver. It's an uqiyya. It's actually a measurement. He says, I, would, I want 40 measurements. The weight of so much of gold. And I'd like 300 trees. Now, do you know what that means? That will take a long, long time, which means you need to plant 300 trees. That time in Medina, if you plant 100 trees, maybe 
20 will survive and the other 80 will die because of the heat. And out of those 20, maybe 10 will bear fruit and the other 10 might not bear fruit. So to do that is very difficult. It will take you many years. It was something like, like he's arrogant. You know, someone says, okay, if you can touch the ceiling, I'll let you go. And what if you jump? Shoo, you come down. <gasps> okay, go, go, go. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So, Salman al-Farisi comes back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. What a man, what a great man. And he says, oh messenger, this is what he is saying. The Prophet says, okay, get these seedlings, these pods, and you and your friends can dig 300 little holes and then call me and I will plant these pods and inshallah they will all grow. So Salman al-Farisi and he got a few of his friends, they went and they dug in the orchard of this man, 300 little holes and they called the Prophet Sallallahu they gave him the pods and he started, Bismillah, he started planting them. Guess what? Within the short space of time, they all, all of them grew and all of them bore fruit. All of them. This is one of the miracles of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of his miracles is when he planted something, it happened. It grew. It bore fruit. And the fruit was amazing. So subhanallah, what was left was the 40 uqiyah that were to be given. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, gives a, a little bag to Salman al-Faris. He says, take, take this and give it to your master. Salman says, what is this? He says, this is something that came to us and we're giving it to you. So he looked in it, there was exactly 40 uqiyah, he gave his master and he was free. He was free. Now that he's a free man, he took part in the battle of the trench. So the battle of the trench was when the allies came to Medina Munawwara in order to wipe out the Muslims. So many of them came from Mecca and the surroundings. And they allied with a few of the groups of the Jewish people around Medina Munawwara as well. And so the... They were all converging onto Medina and it was going to be difficult to fight them. And Salman al-Faris, he was one of those who said, Oh Messenger, peace be upon him, I have a suggestion. In Persia, when the enemy is about to come, we dig a trench around the city, around the city in places where it is possible for them to come through, so that it is impossible for the horses or their animals to actually come across. So why don't we do that? And the Prophet ﷺ said, amazing, amazing suggestion. Let us follow it and we will do that. And this is why it is known as the Battle of the Trench. That same trench was the idea of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. So that is one of his, uh, you know, one of the virtues of this great companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. What a great man. We learn a lot. He was, one of, he was the only one who happened to have been the, a strict follower of three religions ending with Islam. He was a fire worshipper, then he became a staunch Christian, and then he became a Muslim. He was the only one of the kind, the one from Persia. He came all the way from there and he came back. He came to Medina Munawwara and he joined the Prophet ﷺ. He passed away at the time of Uthman ibn Affan Once he was appointed the Amir of Madayan. And I'll end with this story inshallah. He was appointed the Amir of Madayan, Al Madayan. And you know what happened? He never used to like to be an Amir. He never used to like to be a leader. He never used to like to be. He was always humble, down to earth, very, very knowledgeable person. So he was so humble that people didn't really know that this is the Amir. So some outsiders came to Madayan and they saw this man sitting in the outskirts of Madayan and they looked at him. His clothing was like, you know, mediocre. They said, hey, we need some help with our belongings here. Can you help us carry it? He says, yeah, it's fine. I'll help you. He gets up and he carries the whole load on his shoulders. And he's walking and these people are walking. These visitors are walking next to him. And he's walking. So as people are passing, they are greeting this man. The man who's got all the stuff on his shoulders, he's being greeted by the public until someone says, Assalamu alaikum, ya Amir. And these, these visitors are looking, hey, this guy is like a worker here. He's like a laborer. He's helping us with our luggage here. And they, they're calling him Amir. What type of Amir is this? Is he an Amir? So they inquired, who is this man? You know, they ask him, who's this guy? He said, no, this is our Amir, the Amir of Madayim. He's the, like what, would we, what we would say, the mayor of the city, subhanallah. Or even higher than the mayor. They were 
were shocked. Hey, he said, no, 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 I'll take your goods. What's wrong? I, I told you I'll take your goods. Imagine the humbleness. With us, forget about being a mayor or a counselor or someone big. If you are a CEO of a small company that sells this flower here, you won't want to talk to someone else because I'm a CEO. Make an appointment first. Come. If someone says, hey, please can you carry my bag for me? What will you do? Subhanallah. But today I had a really senior figure tell me, can I always carry your bags for you? MashaAllah. May Allah accept it. Alhamdulillah. I'll carry my own bags here. Barakallah fiqh. Jazakallah fiqh. So, this was Salman al-Farisi, humble man. And that's the point that we're learning from this last example to say, no matter who you are, no matter how powerful you are, this was a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. This was one of the close people of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And look at him, so loved by people, such a knowledgeable man. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. Surely, we have lessons from the stories of young believers who struggled and strove in order to find Allah and worship Him alone. How much are we prepared to struggle and strive in order to find Allah and to worship Him alone? May Allah strengthen us all. It was an absolute pleasure speaking in front of you this evening. I pray that Allah grant me the ability to follow what I have preached myself. And may Allah grant you all the ability to take the best of what was said and to adopt it. May Allah help us to follow in the footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the footsteps of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the footsteps of the companions including Salman al-Farisi radiyallahu anhu. And may Allah be pleased with us all. May He gather us with them all in Jannah. May we be all granted forgiveness by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahu bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.